Cramp. Probably everybody watching has experienced it at some point, so it's truly one of the most universal human physical experiences, if not one of the most pleasant, and yet we don't really understand it. Sure, you can do what every serious medical professional does when they don't know something, look it up on YouTube, and you will find no shortage of videos telling you the cause of cramp. Except they don't. They tell you risk factors for cramp, or things we think precipitate it. Things I'm sure you've heard before. Excessive exercise, dehydration, electrolyte disturbance, medication, blah blah blah. They don't actually tell me anything about what is going on inside my muscles to cause them to lose the f***ing plot. So the information contained therein is useful, but boring. And this is Medlife Crisis, where we focus on the useless, but interesting. I don't know why I use the plural there, it's, um, it's just me. And what I, a you know, senior doctor with a long-standing inter interest in exercise physiology, do not know is what exactly is happening when we get a cramp. I've genuinely never learned this. What is the mechanism? Why do our stupid, moronic, junk heap, meat popsicle bodies do this to us? Well, after the scientific resource that is YouTube let me down, I did what I probably should have done in the first place anyway, I went to the medical literature, and researching cramp has actually produced a few valuable lessons about the state of science and research overall. In a way, I love the fact that there are still these really fundamental questions about basic things in human biology that remain unanswered, like why we yawn, or how the placebo effect works, I just made a video on that one, why we age, how general anaesthetic works, or why America can say aluminum. So let's see if we can figure this one out. As a demonstration of how niche this is, I you know, have a medium-sized Twitter following, just under 50,000 followers who are mostly medical or science adjacent, and I asked if any were or if they knew any experts in cramp. Not a single reply. So if you are an expert in cramp, please do get in touch. Although I will declare now that uh, as soon as I hit publish on a video, I typically completely stop caring about it and the subject matter entirely. However, I have an ulterior motive uh, why I've spent so much time looking into this other than just dedication to the noble vocation of YouTubery. I get absolutely agonizing cramp. Not the kind where you're playing sports or sitting on the floor for a while in your thigh or your foot. That's okay, I get those too. I can just stretch them out and no big deal. And I'll talk about the different cramp a bit later on. But in my calves, invariably when I've just woken up in the morning, the slightest flex of my calf muscle, the, the gastronemius, literally just moving my foot a millimeter downwards and like a hair trigger, boom, my calf cramps up and I leap out of bed in pain. And the Pain is bad, but I realize the main reason I've come to dread this so much is not the immediate pain, it's because I know in that split second that I'm gonna be in pain for a week and there's nothing that I can do to stop it. If, as the normal definition you'll find online for cramp, is the transient, temporary, contraction of part of the muscle, why am I left out of action for days afterwards? Is this like some evil version of muscle memory, or have I actually damaged the muscle in some way? I'm sure I can't be the only one who experiences this, so I'd really love to hear your cramp experiences, which is probably a sentence that hasn't been said before, because this isn't something that's well documented or talked about in a scientific way all that much. Now, I, I've got something called benign fasciculation syndrome, which is where muscles twitch uncontrollably, like a lot of people get in their eyelids, but I used to get in my abs or my glutes, biceps, and, and those kinds of muscles quite frequently. It has actually pretty much gone in recent years, as I'm getting old. Um, but I was already aware that there was an overlap be between that and cramp, so I assume that I'm predisposed to getting cramp in some way. You might have seen these viral videos where someone has filmed a severe muscle cramp with the muscle visibly, you know, sucking in, cramping up. And I don't understand these because the person seems quite calm and able to hold a camera, and that is not my experience at all. No matter how quickly I get up to stretch the muscle out, I am left with a tender lump in my calf for the next few days. And me wondering what the hell that lump is, is the question that kind of prompted this whole video because I simply couldn't get an answer from anywhere online. But luckily I have access to ultrasound machines at work. And a little while ago, after I had one of my fairly regular acute agony sessions, I scanned that lump in my leg 
and I was really surprised with the result. As a quick aside, I learned from Tom Scott that a leg cramp has actually got a specific name on the other side of the Atlantic. Charlie Horse for 400 points. That is... And uh, I just there. Is that is that like some American? That is an American term for a cramp, I think. I see. All right. Some sort of cramp. I don't know. These are all very American cards. All right. Well, you're paying for your surgery here, Tom. Did did that not give you a clue? It's an American game. <laughs> the one thing everyone will tell you about when you mention cramp is dehydration and electrolytes. Sorry, that's actually two things, isn't it? But. I'm pretty confident that when I'm getting cramped, my electrolytes haven't gone up the spout. My blood test is not going to show an abnormal sodium or potassium, magnesium, calcium. Those are quite pathological states to be in. Even when patients come into the hospital who are quite sick, their electrolytes aren't always deranged. And I don't have overt evidence of dehydration, but, you know, blood tests measure exactly what they sound like they do, blood levels, which is often not the same as what's going on inside a cell. So that was my initial starting point when trying to figure out why this happens, because it can't be as simple as just an abnormal electrolytes or dehydration, because that isn't reality for most people. Let's start by looking at the different types of cramp. Period cramps are, of course, one of the most common and can be intensely painful as well. These are caused by contraction of the large, powerful muscle in the uterus. And obviously, I don't have first-hand experience of this one, but there is some interesting research suggesting it can be as painful as a heart attack. Uterine muscle is smooth muscle, which is different to striated, or literally stripy muscle, which is skeletal muscle. In essence, smooth muscle is not controlled voluntarily. You find it in many places in the body, your blood vessels, your gut, the muscles that move food along. I, I don't know why I'm doing this motion. Maybe this is, this is medical sign language for peristalsis. Uh, and that's the word we give uh, the movement of stuff through the gut. Uh, do you know what the word is for the sound of all that movement? The, the tummy rumbles. Boborygmi. Any OG subscribers may remember my medical words video from a few years ago, which legitimately I think is still one of my favorite videos that I've made. Honestly, I think, um, I don't know why I've gone on this massive tangent. I think thinking about cramp for so long ha has driven me a bit peculiar. Of course, you have one other type of muscle in the body, which is the heart. And thank goodness we don't get cramp in the heart. But that's also kind of interesting. Why not? That's a rhetorical question. We don't know. But it's doubtless something to do with the fact that the heart muscle cells are just so highly specialized and insanely efficient compared to other cells, which also might give us a clue um, to the crampy cause. Then we have what's called pathological cramp. This is muscle cramping in the context of a disease such as things like liver disease or diabetes causing problems with the nerves, which is a neuropathy, or diseases affecting the neuromuscular junction like motor neuron disease or ALS. Remember the ice bucket challenge? That seems like a, a lifetime ago. And sometimes cramp can be caused by medication. I'm not going to be considering any of those types of cramp in this video. I'm going to focus on cramp affecting healthy skeletal muscle. In general, this is classified as exercise-induced cramp or nocturnal leg cramps. It's actually unclear if they're different phenomena. In fact, some papers go further to subdivide multiple types of cramp, calf cramp that footballers get in extra time, full body lockups that American footballers and tennis players apparently describe, cramp in small muscles that uh, typists might get, cramps that are preceded by fasciculations or twitching, cramps that occur at the start of exercise, cramps that occur at the end of exercise. You can keep going further and further down the rabbit hole which is kind of cramped. But to preserve my sanity, I think we can group them together as cramp affecting striated or skeletal muscle in the absence of any systemic disease or toxin, i.e. in healthy people. Whew, okay, we've got that out of the way. For something that is so common, the Wikipedia entry is remarkably brief. Pages and pages on the toilet paper orientation debate or erotic bluey fanfiction, but a few paragraphs on this and no proposed mechanism, which is reflective of the fact that there isn't a great deal of scientific evidence about this. And those of you familiar with the medical field will know that this isn't an unusual thing. When there's no money to be made from research, it's unlikely you'll receive much funding. I found about 50 papers from the last few decades that go into some proposed mechanisms of cramp, and it boils down to a shootout between two competing theories, the dehydration hypothesis and the neuromuscular hypothesis. Let's start with a helpful meta-analysis of multiple studies, which defines a cramp as severe involuntary muscle contraction that resolves in seconds, minutes, or 
in the worst case scenario, several hours. While the severe pain goes away quickly for me, I couldn't find much about a lingering tender lump that persists for days. However, another review article which looked at endurance athletes said some cramps can indeed last days, and even said that can end athletic careers prematurely. Now, I didn't know that, and that is crazy. Before I get into possible explanations for cramp, I think we ought to understand the basics of how muscles contract. Now, I could do a ham-fisted job of this, but there's really only one muscle that I care about, and thankfully, as I mentioned, the heart isn't troubled with all this cramping nonsense, so instead I thought I'd ask a friend who is so dedicated to understanding muscle that he's collected an absurd amount on his own skeleton. If you want to understand physiology, there really is nobody better than Dr. Mike Todorovic, whose fantastic channel with Dr. Matt Barton is currently on exactly the same number of subscribers as me, and sure to leave me in the dust very soon. And so let's go over to Mike to explain the basics of how muscles work. Ah, now this is a bit embarrassing. Um, when I first spoke to Mike, I pretended to be Australian. Um, and it's been a few years now, and I've just kind of got trapped in the lie. I mean, you know how it is. Good day, Mike. Hey, Rowan. Mike, I'm making a video, but Mike, uh, what are you wearing? T-shirt. Uh, no, that's a way to get my video demonetized. Keep that skin tight stuff on OnlyFans, thanks. Listen, Mike, I'm making a video about why I get such insane cramp, whether anybody actually knows what cramp even is. So I figured we need to just start with understanding how muscles contract, and I thought you'd be just the guy. There wasn't a question, Mike. Can you just get on with it, you can't? Skeletal muscle like your biceps tend to cross joints, like the elbow joint here. And when that muscle contracts, that muscle shortens. And that results in the movement of the joint. And this is how skeletal muscle allows for you to move every single day. If you look inside of that muscle, you'll see that the contraction is due to just two major types of proteins. These proteins include that of mycin, which I've drawn up in blue, and actin that I've drawn up in red. For this shortening and contraction to occur, the mycin, specifically these mycin heads that you can see, they need to bind to the actin. And once they're bound to that actin, they need to pull that actin inward. That is the shortening, that is the contraction. The problem is that the mycin cannot bind to the actin because the actin isn't free and available. Think about it like this. You are mycin and you want to ride your bike, which is the actin. The problem is that the actin or the bike has a bike chain wrapped around it. In this case, the bike chain has a name called tropomycin. And as we know, Bike chains are useless unless there is a bike lock. And there is a bike lock in this case, and it's called troponin. So what do we need in order to ride the bike? We need a key. That key is called calcium, specifically calcium ion that the muscle releases. Once the muscle releases the calcium, it unlocks the troponin, the tropomycin chain falls away, and the myosin heads combine to the actin. But now you need energy. Nothing can occur without energy, and energy in this case is going to be ATP. So there's two things that skeletal muscle must release for muscle contraction to occur. That is both calcium and ATP. Oh mate, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, what are you up to the rest of the day? Throwing a few shrimps on the barbie, eh? Having a cold stubby? We're not really doing this, are we? Playing with the ankle biters? Listen to a bit of akadaka? Chuck on the budgie smugglers, eh? Oh, just shut up, you stupid bastard. Ah, oh, don't spit the dummy, you great galan. No need to go tropo. Nin? <laughs> a little biology jug for those in the know? Right, that's it. Uh, good on you, mate. No dramas. A uh, few kangaroos loose in the top paddock, that one, but uh, he's a good lad. Oof, this, uh, this video's got way too Australian suddenly, hasn't it? Well, here's a picture of the Chinese economy to bring the Aussie levels back down to baseline. Now, we've established how muscles work and the pivotal role of calcium, which you just heard about. Received wisdom about how cramp works is that the muscle contraction is caused by the calcium, possibly related to changes in sodium and potassium as well, because the levels of these electrolytes are often linked. But the jury is out. And if you go back as far as the early 1900s, which I did, a whole bunch of ideas have been put forward and retracted over the years, but bringing us up to the present from all the reading that I've done is how I think we can examine these two rival mechanisms, one that is almost a century old and one that was put forward in the 90s. 
First, there is the dehydration theory, or as one heavily cited paper said, dishydration, which I admit is a term I'd never heard before. Perhaps because it's nonsense. It could be some ill-defined invented phenomenon, or it's a typo, and everybody has dutifully quoted it in their own papers ever since without checking. Science. Well, maybe that's the first state of science um, lesson. Lesson number one. Mistakes can propagate through the literature. And the other candidate is, our 90s kid, is the neuromuscular mechanism, i.e. some sustained abnormal discharge of the signals causing muscle contractions. The first thing I found is how contradictory studies seem to be. Several suggest that cramp seems to be more common early in a training program when fitness levels are lower and on cold days. And lots of the published data are from very fit people like endurance athletes, so you know how applicable is that to the average person? An old study of steel workers suggested hot weather is a risk factor. Quite a few link dehydration to cramp, but some say dehydration doesn't correlate with rates of cramp. But it does correlate with increasing age, any history of heart or kidney or gastrointestinal problems, being on prescription medication, and a higher BMI. These all did correlate with more cramp, which is not to say they cause cramp. But then again, from the same cohort of people, um, those who complained of recurrent cramp actually showed lower BMI seems to be worse. As the authors of a review article succinctly put, there seem to be some mutually contradictory statements here. What a mess. After I had read about 30 papers or so, I honestly didn't feel much the wiser. And as with any area of science where evidence is weak, opinion tends to become the strongest driving factor as to how emphatically authors will propose what they believe is the mechanism. And that's maybe state of science lesson number two, beware of editorial spin and bias. Dehydration is still the leading theory of the two, and I'm sure it's the one that you've heard about. The theory goes that as you sweat, you lose water, and the concentration of salts in your blood, the osmolality, goes up because you're losing more water than, than salt. And this draws fluid out of your cells into what's called the interstitial space, causing increased pressure on the nerves, causing them to become more excitable. Meanwhile, the neuromuscular hypothesis, the 90s kid, proposes localized muscle fatigue, causing increased spinal cord excitability via exciting the muscle spindles and inhibiting the Golgi tendon organs. And those two things you can think of as essentially like stretch receptors in your muscles and your tendons. And yes, if you remember the Golgi apparatus inside a cell from biology class, same guy named this. In fact, Golgi, I think, has loads of things named after him. And uh, on that note, why not? I'll tell you now. You heard it here first. I have started work on the intracellular tier list to follow up the organ tier list. Uh, and that's coming soon. Soon. Um, and that excited spinal cord then causes the muscle to contract uncontrollably. And this tendon, spinal cord, muscle pathway echoes the way reflexes like your knee jerk uh, reflex works. When I was trying to dig into dehydration, first of all, I couldn't actually find anything suggesting dehydration was actually present in people getting cramp. There were loads and loads of studies saying people who sweat a lot get cramp, but not direct observation of dehydration. Multiple problems with the theory were raised, such as runners with or without cramp having no difference in their blood tests, or why a systemic loss of fluid or change in sodium concentration would only affect one part of one muscle. Then I found a review, uh, a review article, which put forward a good case for dehydration. A review article is something where people have already summarized lots of the existing data, which is great because then you can follow all their references back to the source, starting with a retrospective look at workers that built the Hoover Dam way back in the 1930s. And this gave me my first clue, strongly suggesting excessive sweating led to cramp. Back in 1936, they, of course, didn't have isotonic drinks like Lucozade or Gatorade or Pocari Sweat or the connoisseur's choice, of course, Prime. Oh, actually, non-Asians might not know Pocari Sweat. What is Pocari Sweat? That's a terrible name for a drink. But uh, ever since I first saw it when I made a pilgrimage to Japan over 20 years ago as a first-generation weeb, 
I have just loved the idea of selling a drink called Sweat and people buying it voluntarily. It tastes about how you'd imagine it would. Weirdly enough, I hadn't thought of Bakari Sweat um, since like 2014 when they were in the news because they wanted to become the first company to advertise on the moon. No joke, because they heard that water had been discovered on the moon and I, I guess they were planning on rehydrating it or something. They were going to put a capsule on the moon um, and uh, restore all its electrolytes. I went to check it when I was making this video if that ever happened. And no, of course, it didn't happen. But apparently it's going to launch this autumn. Um, sorry, I keep doing these tangents. I'm, I'm, I don't know why. I will try to focus now. It's brain cramp or something. I like this review article, which seemed to be well written, and I was feeling pretty convinced about the electrolyte dehydration theory. And then I found this at the end of the article. This supplement was supported by the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, the GSSI, and the supplement was guest edited by this person who attended a meeting of the GSSI expert panel and received honoraria from the GSSI, a division of PepsiCo for his participation in the meeting. I should say, the authors themselves were not paid or had any links to declare with Gatorade. Now, does that mean what is contained in this article is incorrect? No, of course not. But it kind of calls into question what I'm reading. And this is State of Science lesson number three. Conflicts of interest abound. You can have the most honest principal investigator for a trial who takes no personal money from a drug company, but the research itself, and hence that person's career, may be funded by a pharmaceutical company who might exert editorial control over what results are released, for example, which sometimes the investigators don't have the final say over. For a study, you can still check the methodology and the data. So I'm definitely not suggesting any industry-funded trial is untrustworthy. And this is quite a tiresome trope from online quacks. Um, there is that safety mechanism. You can consult the raw data and see exactly what they've done. Um, but of course, you know, uh, they, the company may choose not to publish negative trials, so that's a separate topic in itself. But a review article like this, by definition, involves a bit of subjectivity because you have to collate so many sources of data and give your impression. So I kept looking. For the neuromuscular theory, I dived into about a dozen papers looking at specific parts of the pathway, particular mechanisms, mouse models, small studies of human muscle cells in the lab, and I quickly got lost. It sounded plausible, and I felt like this is probably where I'd put my money if I had to choose, but there were things that contradicted each other, there were inconsistencies between studies. The bottom line is, I simply didn't have enough expertise in the relevant field to draw any meaningful conclusions. And that's State of Science Lesson 4. You need relevant knowledge in order to assess the quality of studies. This is why I always advise caution with online or media medical experts who seem to cover a new topic every week and um, know about every imaginable field of medicine, even if they immerse themselves in a topic for a week or a month. There's no possible way they can spot their blind spots, or as you know, Rumsfeld said, the unknown unknowns. I don't think I've got answers to many of my questions, but I do have knowledge of a field I hadn't explored before, and a deeper understanding of many of the processes involved, even if the exact mechanism is unknown. Many of the papers conclude by saying probably both theories are implicated in some ways, and perhaps CRAMP is just too disparate a group of different problems with a similar end symptom. Remember, I ignored all the pregnancy and period cramp and cramp secondary to disease or medication, um, which all falls under cramp as a term. So maybe they're just too disparate to be accurately considered a single entity, a bit like cancer, um, you know, which we refer to as one disease, but it's actually dozens or hundreds of diseases. This, this sounds bad, doesn't it? I'm not uh, comparing the two, even though uh, my cramp is painful. I will concede that cancer is probably worse. Um, cancer is, of course, the big C, so maybe from now on we can refer to cramp as the little c. So why is cramp so hard to study? Well, the first reason is that it's simply very unpredictable. You can't stimulate it easily. You can't provoke it. There are no easy animal models to use. And secondly, there are no lives to be saved and very little money to be made. So what's the motivation aside from idle curiosity or the desire to write a YouTube video? So if you want to find out, I am launching a Kickstarter 
to abduct, <laughs> sorry, I mean recruit a hundred athletes and isolate them on an island, divide them into groups where I subject them to different physiological insults, differing steroid regimens, take deep muscle biopsies as they train, bleed them, dehydrate them, overhydrate them, make them wear itchy polyester, sever their spinal cords, graft them together to form a long human cat. I've said too much, but you can help me by raising 8 million in Bitcoin, and I promise I will find an answer to the greatest unanswered question of our time. I'll make space on my mantelpiece for the inevitable Nobel Prize and finally find out what causes cramp. This truly is the pinnacle of scientific endeavour. I hope you can also see that in areas like this, which aren't hot topics and don't receive much attention, the quality of publications is very poor. Many of the studies that health podcasters like to cite about breath work and ice baths and saunas and mindfulness and all the other fashionable practices that they often talk about are actually incredibly badly performed studies or just extrapolations from very limited data sets and observational junk. Ironically, these tend to be the ones discussed by not just podcasters, but the media in general, rather than the really well-performed, high-quality studies that give much more useful advice and are published in much better journals. But because they typically come out with things we've heard before, eat healthily, exercise, sleep well, and so on, they don't get the same traction. And that's State of Science lesson number five. Sexy science sells even if it's rubbish. Now, I'm trying to be more like a typical medical influencer these days, so in addition to wearing ass-hugging designer scrubs, I need to bring everything back to myself. And I told you that I scanned my calf with an ultrasound machine the day after I got a bad morning cramp to find out what that sore sort of, you know, it's like a three centimeter lump in my calf, it's tender, lasts for days, to find out what it actually was. And uh, I, Got a picture, I didn't know what I was looking at, sorry, the only machine I could access that day was a cheap one that doesn't save images, so excuse the, the phone picture. I went to ask one of my radiographer friends who told me this was a hematoma, which kind of blew my mind. A hematoma is basically a, a, a lump of blood, a 3D bruise. Normally a hematoma that size is caused by significant trauma to the muscle, like, you know, getting punched. But my body had done that to itself. My calf muscle had cramped up so hard, the blood vessels had actually ruptured and I'd bled into my muscle. What the actual fuck? But at least it made a bit of sense. That's why my cramp pains last so long. That's why I have this lump there. I'm basically getting, uh, you know, a big repeated bruise in my leg. I really haven't been able to find much about this online at all, so please do chime in if you know more. Now, I said Midlife Crisis videos are interesting but useless, but uh, because this might not have been very interesting, let me at least try to be slightly useful and answer the most important question for the fellow unhappy crampers. Does anything consistently help? And that is a resounding no. Well, maybe not resounding. When all the prevention strategies have been analysed, none uh, was found to reliably have any real effect on cramp. Magnesium, fluid, stretching, nada. That doesn't mean that they never worked in individual cases, because there are some caveats here. A major one is this was based on actually very limited study data. And it is so erratic that there may have been effects um, that uh, are overall not captured and it would need subgroup analyses. Um, and it doesn't mean it never works, but overall the net effect seems to be zero. However, the fitness levels of people in these studies can be very varied, so it's hard to tease out what might be relevant to you. So with all the provisos that this is just anecdotal, which I feel less concerned to say than I would normally, because there's no strong evidence in this case. But for me, who is not an elite athlete, so you know, you can imagine that if someone is a professional athlete, improving their fitness level isn't really going to change anything about their cramp because they're already so fit. But for me, the more I exercise, particularly when involving stretching, the better my cramp seems to be. Now, I talk about exercise on this channel a lot. I talk about it on other channels a lot. There is one medicine that's better than any other. In a nutshell, uh, the most important thing is exercise. Exercise, aerobic, anaerobic, and resistance. Exercise, exercise again. Exercise, exercise, exercise. If you haven't guessed where I'm going with this, I'm of course talking about exercise. And yet, 
viewers, I have to confess something. I've been a hypocrite. A combination of starting my new job as the big boss man, moving out of London, um, spending all of my free time doing up our house and the garden, and of course, most importantly, being a husband and a dad. This is where I pivot to becoming a YouTube wife guy. Meant that over the last year uh, or so, I've really let my exercise slide. I was perhaps in the best shape I've been in since my 20s before I left London, mostly because I was paying quite a lot for a trainer. Just having someone to motivate me uh, was essential because my big problem is laziness. You lack discipline. I enjoy exercise, but I'm sure all of you out there who are busy for any number of reasons can empathize with that feeling of just struggling to muster the energy. My resting heart rate had started to climb up from the mid 40s to the high 50s. I felt weaker, my aging, body's aches and pains became worse, and my recovery time from cramp was definitely getting longer. So I knew I had to do something. So I constructed myself a little home gym. All right, it's workout number one. And it gathered dust. Uh, and then I finally accepted that I needed some help. And since January, I have got back into regular exercise thanks to Copilot, who are sponsoring this video. Copilot is an app, but it's different to other fitness apps because it's really a direct connection to a real person who helps you towards your fitness goal, whether that's to run a marathon, have rippling muscles, or improve your back pain and stop getting so much cramp. Guess which category I fell into. They assign you a professional coach based on your preferences and goals. I was paired up with Austin. We had an in-depth chat about what I wanted to get and he designed a tailor-made plan for me based on what I had at home. If I didn't have any weights, that's not a problem. It, you know, you don't need equipment. The plan is also dynamic. He changes it as we go based on my progress. For me, the number one thing is accountability, motivation to work out. He'll drop me a line if I miss a session to see what's up and then can adapt things on the fly if I say I've got an injury, which is basically all the time. We message each other now, uh, you know, through the app and we've become buddies. We compare DIY and camping pics. Man, I'm such a cliche dad. You already know that I'm a wearables nerd, so what really attracted me to Copilot was the involvement of really slick tech with an app that shows you each exercise, but also uses your Apple Watch to produce really detailed data on your reps, how fast, how high, so that my trainer can give me feedback. Austin can see if I'm not going high enough on my hip thrusts or skipping some reps from the end of my pull-ups. You don't need an Apple Watch at all to use Copilot, but it is even cooler if you do. Exercise is a wonder drug. It improves your mood, cardiovascular health, increases your lifespan, reduces your chance of hundreds of illnesses, and just makes you feel better. It's one of the greatest things you can do for yourself, and even as someone who knows how much it helps, I have still found Copilot invaluable at getting me back in my gym in the garage or on my bike. It's helped me rebuild the healthiest habit I had, which I had let slip before I joined up. I can honestly say I'm feeling so much better than just a few months ago. My resting heart rate is going back down. It's 52 now, getting there. And because it's flexible and affordable and personalized, over 75% of Copilot users continue to work out after the first 100 days. So if you too want your own coach to help you reach your fitness goal, click my Copilot link below or use the QR code on screen to get a 14-day completely free trial with your own expert fitness and health coach. And you'll even get to see the rare double tash as Austin and I both rocked some questionable looks. I really wanted to work with Copilot because on top of all the promotion that I give on behalf of Big Exercise, if I can help you get fitter or feel better, even in a very small way, I will truly feel happy for the first time to be referred to as a health influencer. So give it a try, free.